Thank you. Uh, the Honorable Host, Professor Leonard Sebastian, Coordinator Indonesia Program, Raja Ratman School of International Studies, Singapore. Distinguished guests, especially Ambassador of Indonesia to Singapore, Bapak Andri Hadi, and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the Ratnam School of International Studies, RSIS, for having invited me to speak in this forum on the political environment and reform in Indonesia beyond 2014. It's an honor for me to speak at SRIS because in Indonesia, RSIS is widely known as a credible studies institution for discussing various issues about the situation and development in many countries. Therefore, I will use this honorable forum to express my views and observation on the issues as requested. In my understanding, the topic on political environment and reform in Indonesia beyond 2014 must begin with the question, what are the situation and the prospect for reform in Indonesia after the emergence of a new government based on the result of the 2014 general elections and what issues should be of interest to continue the mandate of reform in Indonesia. We must admit in all honesty that the reforms in Indonesia have achieved some progress and successes which can hardly be denied. Although we must also admit that they were also accompanied by serious problems. Such progress, first, the achievement of structural political balance following the amendment of the 1945 constitution. Currently, power is no longer concentrated in one hand. And the second, at the present time, freedom of press has been achieved in Indonesia. The press is free to write anything coverage that harms a person or an institution is no longer dealt with using political violence, but rather it must be accounted for and resolved based on the law in a transparent manner. And the third part, currently, the Indonesian people are now free to establish political parties without being driven to follow a particular political party. For the Constitutional Court has been established which got the law-making process in order to ensure that the constitutional rights of citizens are not violated as expressly guaranteed by the Constitution. Up to the end of January 2013, the Constitutional Court which, which was established in August 2003 has heard 532 cases of judicial review with the petition in 127 of them having been granted. In the sense that the Constitutional Court announced the laws made by the People's Legislative Assembly, Parliament, and the government. With regard to the with regard to fraud and dispute in general election, namely legislative election and presidential election, as well as regional head election, such cases can now be heard and settled by the Constitutional Court. And fifth, at the moment, there have not been any reports of gross human rights violations committed by the state or Indonesian government apparatuses as frequently reported in the past. In the past, Indonesia was constantly being accused, accused of gross human rights violations by the international community. It's true that currently we often heard news 
of human rights violations in Indonesia. However, such violations are horizontal in nature, such as those committed by one community group, community group against another community group, not by the state against its people. In fact, as it is often said jokingly, violations of human rights occurring occurring nowadays are committed by civilians against the state apparatus as group as civilian often attack apparatuses who are on duty. We connect we cannot close our eyes and ears to the fact that there are many people protesting against the reform today. Some even say that we have made a mistake by choosing democracy. Democracy, which is supposed to be from, by, and for the people, is in reality only from the people, by the elite, and for the political ruler at the present time. It's Indonesian condition today. 14 years ago, we called out for reform which had to be interpreted as a democratization in the political life. Subsequently, democracy experienced a leap of tremendous progress that has been often referred to as liberalization. However, the general condition did not actually improve following the reform. Many people then became upset with the democracy being implemented currently. The result of a study by Saiful Mujani et al. in the book People's Power and Analysis of the Voters' Behavior in the Legislative and Presidential Election in Post New Order Indonesia state that the level of people's participation in the Post New Order General Election decreased quite dramatically from approximately 85% to approximately 70%. According to the author, this also illustrates that there has been deterioration in the quality of democracy. Why is this, why is this happening? Have we lost our way in implementing the reform? After the 1999 general election, for the sake of democratization, the 1945 constitution was amended for the purpose of closing the doors to authoritarianism as well as corruption, collision, and nepotism. Today, we have the 1945 constitution with, may, we may say, a far more democratic substance. However, our democracy is still facing many problems because freedom as a typical symbol of democracy has instead, have, has instead resulted in anarchic, anarchic and hedonistic behavior which are contradictory to democracy. Although civil liberties are guaranteed in the Constitution, they have not been able to enhance the quality of tolerance which is non-discriminatory against the minorities. Political freedom has been provided space and guarantee. However, it has not been balanced by civil liberties of quality. Hence, some people say that democracy in Indonesia has gone too far. Kebablasan istilah Indonesia. In the political arena, in the political arena, power relations have been contaminated by the factors of nepotism and transactional politics. In the government sector, many officials have been indicated and some of them have ever been proven to have acted corruptly. In the legal sector, law enforcement has not been optimal with widespread non-compliance with the law Anarchy and democracy are still occurring, occurring frequently. The law, the law has become blamed for the strongly suspected reason that is still con controlled by the law mafia. At the same time, 
democracy without law is bound to cause chaos and destroy democracy itself because the state of democracy being destroyed democratically can potentially occur. And we can see right now is that our democracy is in crisis because the people are only used by the elite to enjoy the power obtained from a transactional democracy. This is what Bom Karno called democracy without demos, namely democracy similar to that in post-revolutionary France. Bom Karno made the following statement regarding this matter. Let us remember, etc. The sovereignty of power of the people in democracy has been bought up by a lot of corrupt elites. In reality, democracy is giving room only to the people in power on the momentum of general election, namely at the time when people are in the voting booth at the polling station. As I have stated above, we must distinguish democracies into different domains, namely the conceptual domain and the implementation domain. It's of use that conceptually the 1945 constitution provides guidelines on the type of democracy that we aspire the and the type of democracy that we want to be. The democracy that we want to be is not just any democracy, but rather a people-oriented democracy with the ultimate goal of public welfare. In my view, our current crisis of democracy is at the implementation level. Therefore, the problems on how the system is being implemented and no longer on how the system is designed. When it comes to implementation, of course, the problem lies in the moral integrity and of the organizers because no matter how good the concept is without moral integrity of those responsible, <coughs> such concepts would be useless. One of the things that can be done is to make the people become smart voters. The people should be made smart in selecting the elite who will take the top position in power in order for them not to get tricked into choosing what or who Aristotle called as demagogue. Political recruitment, which includes nepotism and which is transactional in nature, has so far been proven to produce dirty politicians with negative behavior who are detrimental to the Indonesian people. Indonesia need to build collective awareness about the need to elect representative and leaders who are responsive, objective, competent, and courageous. Indonesia needs to educate its people for them to be able to choose their leaders not only for their being popular, acceptable, and electable, but also based on morality, integrity, and capability. It's also imperative to improve the system and implementation of general elections, including the structuring of the party system. General election that we have carried out, although implemented without any interruption and considered procedurally democratic, have not demonstrated any substantial democratic character. Of no less importance are the issues of leadership and example. Keteladanan. In order to realize, in order to realize a healthy democracy, democracy strong, courageous, incorruptible, as well as clean leadership is needed, rather than authoritarian, authoritarian, and arbitrary leaders. It should be emphasized that firm leaders does not mean cruel and arbitrary leadership. Collective awareness and impetus to realize the ideals of democracy might not be suppressed. 
might not be suppressed. Today, resentment against poor democracy might be culminating, including the resentment against the government of effort against K officials. However, that must not hold back or put down our struggle for upholding democracy in line with the enforcement of the law. Our resentment against political parties must not lead us toward taking the attitude that political parties are not needed because their existence only destroys and manipulates democracy and that they should be dissolved. That should not be the case. As long as Indonesia still believes in democracy and the constitution as an, as an envisaged by the founding father of the state, we should not have any thought about abolishing political parties. Political parties are the most important resources in the recruitment of leaders in, in, in democratic countries. In a democracy, it's still better to have political parties no matter how mediocre they may be, rather than not having any political parties at all. Thus, what we have to do is ask the ex executive or leaders of political parties to take responsibility for the progress of this nation. They must be willing to make change for improvement in building a political recruitment system in an open and fair manner in order to ensure that our existing political parties come up with quality leaders. Strong and capital market economy. In reality, Indonesia has almost all the capital required to make progress and to become a great nation among the nations of the world. Ideologically, Indonesia is so powerful that no force can replace Pancasila as the state's ideology foundation. Every moment, whether it is armed or in the form of debates in the state institution forums, always ends with the victory of Pancasila as common property. Socially, we have a very strong bond as a nation such the collectiveness is always displayed both in joy as well as in sorrow without any segregation on the basis of religion, race, ethnicity, and so on. Economically, our social capital is also very strong, is also very rich, and we rank second in terms of economic growth among all Asian countries. A recent study by McKinsey indicates that Indonesia ranks the 16th in terms of economic power in the world today and it will rank 7th in 2030. The problem we face is not really a lack of capital to move forward, but rather it's poor law, it's poor law enforcement, especially again various types of corruption that still infect our bureaucracy. It's important to underline this issue because it is often stated in the discourse developing that the complexity of economic development in Indonesia has been caused by an unclear and ambiguous concept of economic development. Some even go as far as saying that the concept of economic development in Indonesia is an anti anti-market and anti-foreign capital economy. I must assert that the concept of economic development in Indonesia is very clear. It's pro-people's welfare, pro-social justice, pro-efficiency, and it's not at all anti-market. Furthermore, Indonesia's economic development is not anti-foreign capital because in addition, to being bound by various international economic cooperation agreements, it's virtually impossible for Indonesia to isolate itself by rejecting foreign capital. 
The principles adopted in Indonesia in Indonesia's economic development are the people's welfare, social justice, and efficiency. Economic development in Indonesia is clearly based on the goals of the state, based on the welfare state ideology, as set out in the preamble to the 1945 Constitution, which states that one of the goals of the state and one of the duties of the government is to advance general welfare. The fifth principle of Pancasila, as the state's ideology for nation declares that the state must rely social justice for the entire Indonesian people. At the same time, Article 33, Paragraph 2 and Paragraph 3 state that production branches which are important to the state and which affect the livelihood of the public shall be controlled by the state. Land and water, uh, land and water, and the natural resources contained therein shall be con controlled by the state and shall be used for the greatest prosperity of the people. The aforementioned provision of the constitution clearly outlined that Indonesia's economy gives emphasis to the people's welfare and social justice. There is no single provision that Indonesia's pro-people economy must be implemented with an anti-market or anti-foreign capital attitude. It is ideally practically impossible to place Indonesia's economy in the position of excuse me, in the position of an anti-market economy because market is an absolute requirement in any economy. If the state has to intervene the economic life at any life, at any time, it does not mean that Indonesian government is anti-market, but it's rather only for strengthening the administration of the economy so that it would remain prioritizing the people's welfare and social justice. A problem which is often encountered when a state has to intervene in the market is the occurrence of violence of the provisions of the economic development. Similarly, monopolistic and oligopolistic control of economy often occurs with collusive relations by economic actors and bureaucratic officials as well as political officials hampering the achievement of the goal of the people's welfare and social justice development. Under such circumstances, the state and the government must intervene in order to ensure the existence of fair and efficient competition in the market because fair competition would be beneficial for the people. In, order, in other words, the states and government's intervention in the market is allowed in order to create fair competition, fair competition in which the people would benefit from the market game. Thus, in terms of economic development, Indonesia's constitution and legal system are absolutely not anti-market. It's instead anti-corruption, anti-collusion, and anti-nepotism, or anti-violation of the law. And accordingly, whenever there is any violation of the law, the state and the government must intervene in order to develop healthy economic life. Therefore, one of the keywords in the context of development of market economy in Indonesia is making the law the commander, <laughs> namely the commander that leads the war on unfair economic competition due to corrupt functioning and various other forms of pollution. Making law as the commander. At the concepts at the conceptual paradigmatic level, the principles of constitutional state have been very strongly provided in the state's foundation, the state's constitution, or in various state laws. The current problem actually lies at the implementation level, namely our apprehension in upholding, in upholding those principles in accordance with the applicable laws. 
such a prehensive occurs because the democracy has been developing toward the wrong direction. In such misdirected development of democracy, the processes of the emergence of political and government leadership as well as their performance marked by increasingly stronger transactional politics and politics of mutual hostage taking. Saling Sandra kalau di dalam in Indonesia saling Sandra. Transactional politics is defined as a political process in which a person emerge as a political and government leader following an exchange of political kicks either with money or other facilities which is then followed by the emergence of the politics of mutual hostage, hostage taking. The politics of mutual hostage taking refers to a political situation in which political leaders and holders of power and authority cannot take the necessary actions in the name of their power because they are held hostage by political transaction and their past corrupt behavior. Therefore, the main touch that we have to know is non-discriminatory law enforcement in order to place the law as the commander, as the commander, because we already have all the concepts and rhetoric, social, economic, political, and any other problems will be resolved if the law can be enforced without any discrimination. Making the law as the commander is the obligation that we have to do right now. Why must the law become the commander? There are two fundamental reasons. First, the first one, the law is the law is the dwelling place of virtues. Therefore, the law must be understood not only formally as a product of an authorized institution, or which is traditionally referred to as the rules common. The law must be understood as the dwelling place of virtues for achieving noble goals which are necessary in the life as a society. The second one, despite its function to provide the basis of legitimacy for the rules, power, and action, the law also set the limits. The law also set the limits of power in the form of values and goals set forth in the land, in the law, and the, and the norm of the law itself. Theoretically, law has three goals, namely justice, certainty, and usefulness. Justice can be considered as the universal main goal. The enforcement of justice is the foundation of the integrity and resilience of a nation from both internal and external threats. When justice cannot be enforced, the bond as a nation will disintegrate and the nation will easily succumb to invading foreign power. In fact, it will not even be able in fact it will not be in fact it will not even be able to face internal challenges. As one of the goals of law, legal certainty can be considered as a part of the effort to materialize justice. The actual, the actual form of legal certainty is the implementation or enforcement of law on an action regardless of the person committing the action. With the presence of legal certainty, anyone can predict the consequences if he takes certain legal action. Certainly is needed to materialize the principle of equality before the law without discrimination. On the other hand, the law can also be used to acquire or, or achieve certain benefits in the life as a nation and a state. In addition to its function for enforcing justice, the law can be used as an instrument to guide the behavior of citizens and the state administration implementation in order, in order to achieve a certain condition as a common goal. The law, the law is function as a tool of social engineering in the context 
of national law. The law must, the law must of course be useful for the achievement of the national goal, namely to protect the entire Indonesian nation and the entire Indonesian native land, and to advance the public welfare, to develop the intellectual life or the nation of the nation and to perfect social justice. A legal system has three elements, namely structure, substance, and culture. Those three elements determine whether or not a legal system is functioning and is functioning and in which direction the system is moving. In the context of Indonesia, the structure, the structure is related not only to the type and competence of the judicial institution, but also to the institution involved in the entire, entire judicial process, such as the police, the prosecutor's office, the Corruption Eradication Commission, the National Human Rights Commission, and the Center of Financial Transaction Reporting and Analysis, and other institutions having duties and authority related to the law enforcement. Institutions play a significant role in the just enforcement of law. Law enforcement institutions are the men behind the guns that determine when to pull their triggers and where the guns are to be aimed at. On the other hand, legal structure has a strong influence, influence on the nuance of legal culture. A legal system which abuses the law will automatically create a culture deviating from and abusing the law. There are many facts indicating that one of the problems of law enforcement in Indonesia is the relationship between the law enforcement apparatus and institution. Law enforcement apparatus still cannot escape corrupt practices, bureaucratic reform is stagnant, and law enforcement institutions lack synergy and are even taking each other hostage and threatening each other. As the consequence, there is stagnation. In order to resolve the problem with law enforcement apparatus, there are at least two efforts. This is uh, the last uh, uh, explanation. The first agenda is to strengthen anti-corruption commitment and culture. This agenda is easy to say, but actually it seems to be difficult to implement. We are not only dealing with certain groups actively committing corrupt practices, but also dealing with a social structure which more or less have been permissive toward corruption. Building the commitment and culture of corruption prevention is a big agenda that cannot be left solely to the hands of the state. At this point, civil society organizations have significant role and responsibility. The second agenda is to accelerate the process of bureaucratic reform because much of the problems related to the poor law enforcement act caused by our very corrupt bureaucracy. Bureaucracy in Indonesia is corrupt because the technical procedure and norms as well as leadership are the legacy of the previous regime. I've met a lot of entrepreneurs who are often accused of being bribers briber, or corrupt entrepreneurs financing political activities of many officials. But they told me instead that they committed bribery or gave illegal services to government officials because the official and bureaucrats in Indonesia asked for them. They said that if they did not bribe, they would not get any project. Thus, one of the fundamental problems in Indonesia is how to seriously rearrange bureaucracy in order for it to become clean and professional. The main reason behind the limited success of endeavor for bureaucratic reform is that the system procedure and mechanism as well as the official who have the 
the automatic tendency to work in a trap manner have been developed for decades. This is coupled with the political leadership which is still left with plenty of old prayer. This is coupled with the political leadership which is still left with plenty of old players who have remained unchanged and who have the interest to protect the corrupt practices involving them. On the other hand, new leaders are emerging without a vision. Rather, they only wish to enjoy the opportunities and chance for corruption which they never had before. Many political and bureaucratic officials view the reform as an opportunity to get their turn to load the state's wealth. They view the reform as a death turn for corruption. A bureaucracy well established with corruption tends to be resistant to bureaucratic reform effort. There is a tendency not to implement the adapted policies seriously and consistently especially when not supported by the leader's policies. This is because the old bureaucratic system brought benefits and comfort, while the bureaucratic reform to be implemented is seen as not necessarily offering the same benefits and comfort, and even posing a threat on the existing benefit and comfort. This is not mentioned the fear of corrupt practice committed in the past being exposed. Even more ironically, the relationship among institutions in some cases also indicate that there is a situation of mutual blockade and mutual threat because all of them have their respective legal problems. It would not be fair to say that there has not been any effort to build more synergized relationship among institutions in fair law enforcement effort. Periodically, these high state institutions have also had meetings for dialogue and for synchronizing measures. However, many such efforts towards synergy have not demonstrated any result because each institution and their respective apparatus lack a common commitment to implement the same. The current condition should be regarded as a challenge which must be encountered and resolved at the same time. The social, political, economic, and cultural realities today which appear to be blocking our path in realizing the rule of law state of Indonesia should not cause us to step back from the goal. From the goal. In the war to enforce the rule of law state of Indonesia, which will always go parallel with the struggle to enforce the law and justice based on morality and conscience must be continued. Based on the foregoing, I can conclude now that a variety of problems in Indonesia have not been caused, caused by any conceptual paradigmatic fault or the normative regulation thereof, but rather they have been caused by the deviation of democracy from its underlying system. Such deviation is Make is marked by transactional and mutual hostage-taking politics as a result of which the law cannot be enforced. In my view, the major problems in Indonesia can only be resolved through law enforcement in the sense of making the law as the commander. The effort to make the law as the commander must begin with the structuring of political recruitment in order to make it free of transactional and mutual hostage-taking politics. This is where the awareness of political parties as the forum for, for, for political leadership recruitment is required in order to conduct recruitment with full responsibility and by upholding moral integrity. In my opinion also, 
The concept of reform in various sectors as outlined thus far is still real fun in the context of the political direction of the political journey beyond 2014. For the purpose, it's extremely important to make the law as the commander so that everything can be done in an orderly and well-directed manner. That is why I often state that we need strong leadership, namely the leadership symbolized by the Indonesian national flag, the red and white. Strong leadership in Indonesia must be characterized by red, namely daring to act convincingly. Daring to act convincingly. At the same time, the leadership in Indonesia must be a white leadership, must be a white leadership which is clean from the stain of transactions and hostage taking, in order to enable the courageous characteristics to emerge. Courage, courage not supported by cleanness is bound to be extremely dangerous, while cleanness not supported by courage will become bland and ineffective. I would like to emphasize that with such understanding, a strong leadership does not need to be contrasted with the strong system. For me, a strong leadership is an integral part of the strong system. It could normatively be ineffective. It, it could normatively be ineffective if the system controlled by a weak and indecisive leadership. A strong leadership also cannot be equated with the authoritarian, arbitrary, and cruel leadership. A strong leadership is a decisive, fast, effective, and accountable, characterized leadership. Thank you.